Hey everybody and welcome back for another instalment of Teach Me in 10, the video series that is brought to you by LabTube, which is part of the Technology Networks Group. My name is Molly Campbell and I'm a Senior Science Writer here at Technology Networks. Our Teach Me in 10 video series invites scientists to join us and explain a scientific research area or a scientific concept in less than 10 minutes. We want to make science as accessible as possible for you. Our 10 minute videos provide an overview of the topic and if you'd like to learn more, you can then check out the further resources that are listed in the video description. This week, I'm joined by Jared McKenna, who is going to be talking to us about a scientific method known as cryopreservation. I'll hand over to you now, Jared. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Jared McKenna, and I'm a reproductive biologist from Melbourne, Australia. Today, I will be teaching an introduction to cryopreservation, what it is, what are some of the challenges, and what techniques we have um, to overcome those challenges. So let's dive straight into it. So cryopreservation is the maintenance of cells and tissues at ultra low temperatures without compromising the integrity or viability. And generally speaking, cryopreservation also involves three broad steps. Freezing, storage, and warming, which sounds simple, but of course nothing is ever that simple. And we know that our cells and tissues are incredibly complex with a massive number of organelles inside them and often a large amount of water as well. And that's either bound to DNA, freely moving around the cell or stored within the cell's vacuole, for example. And water being the lifeblood of every living organism on the planet, it is of critical importance to cell function. But it's also the biggest roadblock to successful cryopreservation. And this is mainly due to the formation of intracellular ice. So a real life comparative um, to demonstrate the effect of low temperatures on cell viability would be leaving a drink in the freezer for too long. If anybody like me has done this, they will know exactly where I'm coming from and exactly where I'm going. So let's play this, uh, play this out. If you leave a Coke, in the freezer, over time, ice will begin to form and exert pressure on the can. And what will eventually happen is when that pressure becomes too much and the can's walls can no longer maintain that pressure, um, the can will explode, resulting in no coke and a very messy freezer. The exact same process happens inside cells when they experience low temperatures. So ice begins to form and that pressure begins to um, push out on the cell's membranes when they can no longer hold that pressure in anymore, cell bursts and resulting in a very quick, a very quick cell death. And this is by far and above the most dangerous aspect of cryopreservation and therefore the most important problem to overcome. Another common problem is the structural changes that a cell membrane undergoes during low temperatures. So animal cell membranes are made up of a phospholipid bilayer, which is critical for maintaining homeostasis within the cell. And what happens when those membranes are put under abnormally low temperatures is that they undergo what's called a phase transition. And what this means is that the membranes change from an ordered gel-like state, how they are here, to a disorganized fluid-like state, as you can see here. And this not only affects the, uh, affects the integrity of the membrane itself, but also some of the channels and transporters within the membrane. So without a functioning cell membrane, that once healthy cell can once again die very, very quickly. So how do we prevent ice formation and membrane damage and changes from happening? What techniques do we have? Well, the most common technique and the um, most popular one for a long time um, is called slow cooling. And being a reproductive biologist, I'm going to use sperm as my cell sample here. So if we were to slow cool a sperm sample, we take that sample and add cryoprotective agents to it or CPAs. And essentially these CPAs are compounds that increase cell survival during each step of cryopreservation, the freezing, storage and warming stages. So for slow cooling protocols, this is generally a mix of sugars such as trellose and sucrose and large polymers such as skim milk or egg yolk. And this will change depending on the cell type and depending on the species as well. So in slow cooling protocols, uh, these compounds work in a few ways. Firstly, by increasing the osmolarity outside of the cell um, and decreasing it uh, inside the cell, which therefore pulls water outside of the cell um, and thus lowering the chance of ice formation within the cell. Secondly, if we remember back to the membrane structure again, the sugars that we've added, um, either trailose, sucrose, something like that, actually insert themselves between the head groups of the 
phospholipids in the, in the membrane. And this prevents them from sort of moving around and changing state. So they don't go through that transition stage and go to a less fluid, uh, a less stable fluid like state. They maintain relatively stable. So once we've added the CPAs, uh, we then <coughs> add the samples to a freezing device. This is a common one here called um, Mr. Frosty. And the samples are frozen slowly at a controlled rate and stored for future use in liquid nitrogen. During this freezing step, the slow cooling protocols actually encourage ice formation, quite ironic, um, not within, but externally to the cells. And what this does is um, it actually draws more water out of the cell. And this is a process called seeding. Um, also, as ice takes energy or requires energy to form, even if there is um, water still within the cell, there may not actually be enough free energy within the sample for it to form in the first place. So it's quite a lot going on um, with many different methods to protect uh, the cells during slow cooling. And you can sort of start to see why it's quite complicated, but um, it's a very successful technique and it has been used for a very long time. And when the time comes and those samples are, are needed, the samples are then warmed again in a controlled manner, often in something like a water bath. Um, which slowly uh, thaws out that external ice in the sample and that water is able to move back inside of the cell. A slow process, but a very effective one. Next, we have vitrification, which is a far newer and more popular method um, nowadays for cryopreservation. And this time I'm going to use embryos as my cell samples. So we have our embryos and we add them to our CPA solutions containing, for example, glycerol or ethylene glycol and some of those same sugars that we um, spoke about before in slow cooling protocols. Um, and this is um, in progressively increasing concentrations as well. So these cryoprotectants work in a similar way to how I mentioned in the sperm example um, in that they draw the water out of the cell. However, with um, vitrification protocols and these types of um, cryoprotectants, the water does move out due to an osmolarity effect However, the cryoprotectants do actually move in as well, and thereby dramatically decreasing the chance for ice formation as well, because there is no water within the cell. And this is where vitrification can be um, potentially a lot riskier than slow cooling, as these cryoprotectants are actually highly cytotoxic. And when cells are exposed to them at either too high a concentration or for too long, um, the cells can once again die quite quickly. So it's very important to have a very skilled technician here to move the cells through those um, <coughs> increasing concentrations of cryoprotectants quite slowly and safely. So once those embryos have equilibrated in the cryoprotectants, they're loaded onto a cryo device. This one that I have made here is called a cryo hook. And the embryos are then very rapidly frozen and stored for future use in liquid nitrogen as well. And by having such a rapid freezing rate, vitrification protocols traverse the ice forming temperatures of between zero and minus 100 roughly. Um, extremely quickly, which gives the sample very little time to actually form ice in the first place. So when those embryos are needed again, they're taken out of liquid nitrogen and they're transferred through warming, uh, warmed drops of decreasing cryoprotectant concentration um, until ultimately reaching a medium with no cryoprotectant at all. And it's just a handling media, base media, where they're happy sitting at room temperature, for example. And like I sort of alluded to before, if the embryos are moved um, through solutions um, uh, that are two higher concentrations. So one might be one molar and the next one is 10 molar, for example. Um, the embryos could experience something called osmotic shock and too much water can leave or enter the embryo um, very, very quickly. And again, you guessed it, very quick cell death. Um, the opposite is also true. If it takes too long, um, the cells sit in the cryoprotectants for too long, um, because the CPAs and vitrification protocols are generally cytotoxic, this can also lead to rapid cell death. So too high of a concentration or too high of a concentration gradient um, can lead to osmotic shock and rapid cell death. So vitrification sounds a lot riskier, um, but it's also a lot quicker and cheaper than slow cooling is. And it's performed by, and if it's, if it's performed by experienced handlers, you can get near perfect survival post-thawing, which is why it's such a commonly used technique today. So a little quick rundown of what we just spoke about. Um, slow cooling is generally more expensive and takes a lot longer time-wise than vitrification does. Slow cooling prevents um, ice formation through um, that process called seeding, where it induces ice to form outside of the cell uh, instead of inside. 
And whereas vitrification removes almost all of the water within the cell and freezes so rapidly that there's actually no time for um, the ice to form in the first place. So cooling protocols also protect the cell membranes by those sugar groups binding between the lipid um, head groups and preventing their phase transition, which keeps that membrane very stable. And this also happens in um, vitrification protocols that use um, large macromolecules like um, skim milk or egg yolk or sugars. Um, and lastly, slow cooling is generally very consistent as it's largely an automated process. Um, and while vitrification has the potential to be extremely variable between zero and 100% success rate, once you're suitably trained and you've got enough experience under your belt, this variability dramatically reduces and success rates generally sit around 90 to 100%, um, depending on the cell type, of course. So there you go. That was my crash course um, into cryopreservation. Hopefully that wasn't too quick for everybody and you all enjoyed and, and hopefully learned something. So there's plenty more to talk about on this topic. Um, so if anybody has um, any questions or would like to chat a little bit more, um, feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to answer your questions. So thanks for listening and happy freezing. A huge thank you to Jared for joining us at Teach Me In 10. We hope that you found Jared's video as insightful as we did on cryopreservation. If you'd like to learn more about this technique, please do make sure you check out the video description where we've supplied some further reading for you to check out. We'll be back next week for another instalment of Teach Me In 10. If you'd like to catch up on some of our previous videos, make sure to visit our LabTube channel where you can find all of the Teach Me In 10s that we have published so far. There's a huge library, so I implore you to check those videos out and see what you can learn. See you next week. Bye for now.